Hello everybody and welcome into episode number 301 of the Bible 2021 podcast. We are reading Psalm 119 verses 97 through 128 today and our focus is on the unexpected power of biblical meditation and what is the difference between biblical meditation and Buddhist or Hindu meditation. Well, let's go ahead and get into it because we got a lot to cover today. I do want to remind you of our website. I try to do that every time, Bible2021.com. Our goal is to get all of us involved in daily Bible reading, and I'm hoping this podcast and our website will help you with that. I want to open with a quote from one of my heroes of the faith, George Mueller, who says, The more the, that we, the children of God, meditate on the Holy Scriptures, the more perfectly we shall become acquainted with the true loveliness of God, and the more shall we therefore ourselves seek to please him, and the more shall we seek to stir up others to acquaint themselves with him, that they may please him. Well, I recognize that the words power and meditation don't seem to go together very logically, as in the title of this podcast, which is The Unexpected Power of Biblical Meditation, but the thing is, most people living in the West, including even most Christians, have a lot of preconceived notions when they hear the word meditation. Generally, as we've talked about before, most people think of Eastern meditation when they hear that word, which, you know, involves maybe some chanting, some emptying your mind, centering, focus on your breathing, etc. Well, here is a very brief step-by-step way of doing a fairly generic form of Eastern meditation. Now, I've copied this from the website lionsroar.com, which I do not recommend, but just to give you an idea of what most people think of when they think of Eastern meditation, they think of this. Four steps. Number one, take your seat. Sit cross-legged and upright on a meditation cushion, whatever that might be. Number two, find your sitting posture. Place your hands palm down on your thighs and sit in an upright posture with a straight back, relaxed yet dignified. With your eyes open, let your gaze rest comfortably as you look slightly downward about six feet in front of you. Number three, notice and follow your breath. Place your attention lightly on your out-breath while remaining aware of your environment. Be with each breath as the air goes out and through your mouth and nostrils and dissolves into the space around you. Number four, note the thoughts and feelings that arise. Whenever you notice that a thought, feeling, or perception has taken your attention away from the breath, just say to yourself, thinking, and return to following the breath. So Buddhist meditation and Hindu meditation and other forms of Eastern meditation are really quite similar to that. Buddhist meditation, let me give you a definition, is a way of taking control of the mind so that it becomes peaceful and focused and the meditator becomes more aware. The purpose of meditation in the Buddhist field is to stop the mind rushing about in an aimless or even a purposeful stream of thought. People often say that the aim of meditation is to still the mind, but Biblical meditation is really radically different from all of that, so much so, in fact, that they should really have different words entirely to describe biblical meditation versus every other form of meditation. Well, the Hebrew word for meditation is the word siach, and it comes from a word that means to talk, which is kind of interesting. And when in the Bible that word siach is translated as meditate, it usually means it's in a particular verb form in the Hebrew called the polel. And in that case, the word means to muse or to ponder or quite literally to talk to yourself. Now, this word appears at least seven times in Psalm 119, and I'm going to give you a few instances. Psalm 119 verse 15 says, I will meditate on your precepts and think about your ways. Psalm 119 verse 48 says, I will lift up my hands to your commands, which I love, and will meditate on your statutes. Psalm 119 verses 97 through 99 says, How I love your instruction. It is my meditation all day long. Your command makes me wiser than my enemies, for it's always with me. I have more insight than all of my teachers because your decrees are my meditation. And one more, Psalm 119, verse 48. I am awake through each watch of the night to meditate on your promise. 
Well, notice especially that the focus of biblical meditation is just radically, extremely different from other forms of meditation. Biblical meditation is focused like a laser on God's Word. The goal is not to empty the mind. The goal is not to calm the spirit or to become one with your surroundings or to focus on your breathing or still your thoughts or anything like that. The goal is to focus deeply in on God's Word, thinking about it, musing over it, chewing on it, uh, pondering it, and talking to yourself about it. Christian meditation is thinking deeply, focusing sharply on the truths of God's Word. In meditation, the Word goes from a shallow place, like barely on the surface of the soil of our hearts, to a much deeper place where it can take root. Consider this analogy. Think about a cup of tea. If you have a cup of hot water in a bag of tea, and you dip that tea bag into the water one time and pull it out, do you have tea there? No, not really. What you have is mainly hot water with maybe at the tiniest amount of tea in it. And hearing the word one time, hearing the word of God one time, that is, is like, one small dip of the word into our mind, and reading is maybe like two small dips into our mind. And if we memorize a particular passage, well, that's a few more dips of the the word of God into the hot water of our mind, staying with the uh, analogy. But meditation on a particular passage is even more the word of God soaking into our thinking like a tea bag soaks into hot water. The end result is that our thoughts and emotions have been changed, transformed by God's Word. And here Charles Spurgeon commends for us the practice of biblical meditation and compares it to something good like bodily exercise. Spurgeon says those who would be in good health do not sit in their houses to breathe the still air, but they walk abroad and seek out rural and elevated spots that they may inhale the invigorated outdoor breezes, and thus those godly souls who would be in a vigorous spiritual state do not merely think upon such holy doctrines as may come into their minds in the ordinary course of thought, but they give time to meditation on the Word of God. They, work, they walk abroad in the fields of truth and endeavor to climb the heights of gospel promises. It is said that Enoch walked with God. Here is not an idol, but an active communion. The road to bodily health is said to be a footpath, walking, and the way to spiritual health is to exercise oneself in holy contemplation on God's Word. Now, I want to close this discussion with the wonderful words of George Mueller on how biblical meditation leads us into prayer and how meditation on God's Word invariably strengthens our prayer life and deepens our walk with God. Mueller says, While I was staying at Nailsworth, it pleased the Lord to teach me a truth, the benefit of which I have not lost. I saw more clearly than ever that the first and great primary business to which I ought to attend to every day was to have my soul happy in the Lord. The first thing to be concerned about was not how much I might serve the Lord or how I might glorify the Lord, but how I might get my soul into a happy state and how my inner man might be nourished. For I might seek to set the truth before the unconverted or seek to benefit believers. I might seek to relieve the distressed and I might in other ways seek to behave myself as it becomes a child of God in this world. And yet not being happy in the Lord and not being nourished and strengthened in my inner man day by day, all this might not be attended to in a right spirit. Before this time of discovery, my practice had been for at least 10 years previously to give myself to prayer right after I dressed myself in the morning. Now I saw that the most important thing I had to do was to give myself to the reading of the Word of God and to meditation on it, that thus my heart might be comforted, encouraged, warned, reproved, instructed, and that thus by means of the Word of God while meditating on it, my heart might be brought into experimental communion with the Lord. I began, therefore, to meditate on the New Testament from the beginning early in the morning. The first thing I did, after having asked in a few words the Lord's blessing upon His precious Word, was to begin to meditate on the Word of God, searching, as it were, into every verse to get blessing out of it, not for the sake of the public ministry of the Word, not for the sake of the preaching on which I had meditated on, but 
for the sake of obtaining food for my own soul. The result I have found to be almost invariably is this, that after a very few minutes, my soul has been led to confession or to thanksgiving or to intercession or to supplication so that though I did not, as it were, give myself to prayer, but to meditation, yet it turned almost immediately more or less into prayer. Well, my friends, may that become our practice where, beginning with the word, we are driven into a deeper, stronger, and more fruitful prayer life. Speaking of the word, let's read it now. Psalm 119, beginning in verse 97. How I love your instruction. It is my meditation all day long. Your command makes me wiser than my enemies, for it is always with me. I have more insight than all my teachers because your decrees are my meditation. I understand more than the elders because I obey your precepts. I've kept my feet from every evil path to follow your word. I've not turned from your judgments, for you yourself have instructed me. How sweet your word is to my taste, sweeter than honey in my mouth. I gain understanding from your precepts, therefore I hate every false way. Your word is a lamp for my feet and a light on my path. I have solemnly sworn to keep your righteous judgments. I am severely afflicted. Lord, give me life according to your word. Lord, please accept my free will offerings of praise and teach me your judgments. My life is constantly in danger, yet I do not forget your instruction. The wicked have set a trap for me, but I have not wandered from your precepts. I have your decrees as a heritage forever. Indeed, they are the joy of my heart. I am resolved to obey your statutes to the very end. I hate those who are double-minded, but I love your instruction. You are my shelter and my shield. I put my hope in your word. Depart from me, you evil one, so that I may obey my God's commands. Sustain me as you promised, and I will live. Do not let me be ashamed of my hope. Sustain me so that I can be safe and always be concerned about your statutes." You reject all who stray from your statutes, for their deceit is a lie. You remove all the wicked on earth, as if they were dross from metal. Therefore, I love your decrees. I tremble in awe of you. I fear your judgments. I have done what is just and right. Do not leave me to my oppressors. Guarantee your servant's well-being. Do not let the arrogant oppress me. My eyes grow weary looking for your salvation and for your righteous promise. Deal with your servant based on your faithful love. Teach me your statutes. I am your servant. Give me understanding so that I may know your decrees. It is time for the Lord to act, for they have violated your instruction. Since I love your commands more than gold, even the purest gold, I carefully follow all your precepts and hate every false way. Amen. Well, we close today with our Bible memory passage for the month of October. 1 John 4, 7, and 8, maybe we can say it together. Dear friends, let us love one another, because love is from God, and everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. The one who does not love does not know God, because God is love. Amen. Good day to you, friends, and Godspeed.